Welcome everyone. Today I wanted to talk about Bananas, Deflation, Cardano, and the general state of the crypto ecosystem right now. Contrary to popular belief, I believe Bitcoin price is going up. I believe cryptocurrencies are going up. But I feel like this is not the time for cryptocurrencies to shine. I am going to be talking about a plethora of different things in this video. I may tie them together successfully. I may not. We'll find out. Please leave comments below and let me know if I was able to make that link correctly. But I see a lot on crypto Twitter and I try to stay away from crypto Twitter as much as possible. But uh, there are a lot of people that push the ideas of we're going into hyperinflation. Currencies have been inflating, inflating, inflating. And while I do think that this there's some truth to this, and I've said it before that I think that the monetary system is inflating by printing money. I've been, I believe I've been mistaken this entire time. I've been reading on economists that believe that we're going on the other side, and I'm starting to understand the differences between inflation and deflation. And now I honestly think I had a moment of clarity yesterday that I think that we're going into a deflationary period, a heavy deflationary period where the US dollar is going to be, it's going to reign supreme over everything. I think crypto short term is extremely bearish. I think medium term is extremely bearish. And I think long term, if whatever companies can survive, whatever projects can survive, maybe bullish. But right now, I think that this is just, these are just terrible times for all, a lot of different assets, a lot of different commodities and cryptocurrency as well, stocks as well. And we'll see in the coming weeks what's going to happen. But I anticipate that there are going to be dramatic falls and people are people's investments are going to be extremely hurt, especially during these very tumultuous times. Well, anyway, I've been doing a lot of research, looking at graphs, looking at statistics, using time data in order to extrapolate what's going on in the past and then applying it to the future. So. As you can see at the beginning of the video, I took a quick video of bananas at the grocery store and I don't know how much they are at my grocery store. It might be, I don't, I don't remember the price, but it might be 70 cents, 80 cents, 90 cents, or maybe 50 cents, 50 or 60 cents, depending whether you're going to buy organic or conventional bananas. And the only difference between organic and conventional is the number of pesticides they use. Organic uses a certain number of pesticides, but it's less than the conventional bananas. Why do I know so much about bananas? I wrote a paper in college in 2012, I believe, about the ecological and nutritional impact of monoculture for bananas. So monoculture is this idea of buying, of planting one crop over large swaths of land. And I was analyzing the ecological degradation of doing that and how it affects the local ecosystem. So that goes anything from the chemicals and pesticides that they use in order to irrigate the land and cultivate the bananas. And ultimately that use that spills off as runoff and affects local water rays, often, often affecting the poorest of poorest in the, in the world, all the way to how bananas are cultivated. They're picked at a very green stage. So although these are yellow and you see bananas that are yellow at the grocery store, sometimes you see they're green, you can look at the stem, the color of the stem, that's, it, it's usually a little bit darker on the truck. It's pretty much all green. And when they're transported, they're usually picked to your plate in around two weeks. So they are picked from the tree. And by the time they get transported and sold at your local grocery store, it's been a period of two weeks. They go undergo various different treatments along the way, including like freezing them to, to slow down the the aging process of the banana, but when they're transported in trucks, there is a gas that's sprayed, which is called ethylene, and ethylene ripens the banana. This is why when you put a banana in a plastic bag, or in a paper bag, if you've ever put a banana in a brown paper bag, it naturally will emit that ethylene gas, and that's going to ripen the banana. So since it's all trapped, you can put it in a brown paper bag and it can ripen extremely quickly. That's why you can put it in the brown paper bag for lunch early in the morning. And by the time it's lunchtime, it's ready to eat. It's very spotty. So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
But anyway, I analyzed this food and I'm trying to compare it to deflation because I've been looking at trends through staple products over time. So this means rice, uh, bananas, and any staple commodities that are used in masses for humanity. So this is an essential food. I mean, almost everyone eats bananas. And if you don't eat bananas, you probably eat byproducts of bananas somehow. And if you don't, you're missing out. But a majority of the world can eat bananas and they can eat rice as well. And there are certain staple foods that they've been eating for a very long period of time. So we often get this narrative that there's inflation going on, this hyperinflation because the Fed is printing so much money, yada, yada, yada. That's the narrative that's been pushed. But it is a false narrative. And it is a false narrative because if you look at staple goods, if you look at commodities, if you look at necessities that you need in order to live, certain foods, it's not, it's not across the board. There are some that have undergone extreme price inflation, but over time, these have stayed relatively stable compared to inflation. So if inflation is 2% per year, bananas are like 58 cents a pound. And I, uh, I'm not sure if this is wholesale price or regular price. I'll include the graph below. Last year, they were 59 cents. The year before, 57 cents. All the way back to 19, I don't know, 70s. In the 1970s, they were actually much more expensive. expensive. They were around $3 a pound. So they've actually decreased in price over time. So it's been cheaper. And you can argue economies of scale have made it cheaper. But at the same time, lots of goods have actually decreased in price. They have not matched the inflation calculator. So if you have $3 a pound for a banana, that would be somewhere around the range of $30 or $40, depending on how many decades ago it was. But you can go to the grocery store and still buy bananas on the cheap. You can buy rice on the cheap as well. And if you're not finding these goods for cheap, you're probably not shopping in the correct locations. You also may be in a food desert and buying bananas at the airport also doesn't count. Food deserts are places in America that access to produce and fresh foods is it's a little bit more difficult. You can think about it as if you go and grocery shop at a bodega in New York, you're probably not going to find healthier options. You may find a lot of soda, but you may not find bananas. And it's all about economical footprints. So depending on how the economics of a certain community look like, you'll have access to fresher and fresher foods. I lived in a food desert for two years. I lived in Mississippi, very rural Mississippi. There was no grocery store. There was a grocery store, but it was terrible. But the place where everyone shopped was Walmart and Walmart grocery. I don't want to offend anyone. I, you know, I ate it for a while, but it's not the greatest, especially with produce and vegetables. They tend to go bad pretty quickly. I prefer other grocery stores. So anyway, the prices of bananas have decreased over time. The prices of rice have decreased over time. You can buy more with your money now than you could ever buy before. Economies of scale have pushed everything down. And if you're paying too much for something, that's because you're probably not looking for the correct deal are impatient or you just want to get that thing immediately. People can say that the prices of movie tickets have inflated, but is that really true? You can buy Netflix right now for like 10 or $15 a month and you have access to hundreds of movies. You can use Hulu, you can use uh, various different streaming services and get access to everything. Internet, you can use your internet package to watch a whole bunch of free movies on YouTube. The quality may not be as good as what you see in a movie theater, but the access is there. You can go to the library. You have access to so many goods and services. Even when we talk about manufacturing vehicles, a vehicle in 1970 compared to a vehicle now, you can get like a Toyota Corolla. You can get an entry level Toyota, Toyota for like 15,000 or 20,000, $25,000, depending on the year or how many miles is on it. You can get a used vehicle, a used vehicle. You can get like a used BMW for like four or $5,000. It may give you a lot of trouble long-term, but you can still buy a used vehicle. And that used BMW is probably a hundred times more powerful than the car in the 1970s. Remember, a car has 27,000 to 30,000 parts on average. 27,000 to 30,000 parts on average. And you can buy it for 
under $20,000, a car, a new car, you can even buy it even cheaper. And you can buy a used car sometimes for under $10,000, a car with 27 to 30,000 parts, screws, the engineering is incredible. So you're paying less than a dollar a part. And people are saying that prices have increased for certain goods, for certain goods. I argue that the prices have not, de have not increased. They've actually decreased over time. But the access to goods has increased over time. So the selection has increased. So now you, you have choices and people spend money on different choices. There are so many different choices. You can buy a Toyota Corolla, but you can also buy a Lexus. And you can see, I mean, you can go to the Lexus dealership probably near you and everyone's leasing a Lexus. It may be a forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 car, maybe, maybe even more. But you don't have to get that car, but people choose to get that car. So basically what I'm saying is that the, the value of goods have been decreasing over time. Your dollar is actually more powerful than ever. Just the number of choices that are out there are a lot more expensive, a lot more there, there, there are a lot more choices and people want to use those choices in order to either show status or achieve a certain level of wealth within their life. I know I see that meme all the time of the shopping cart, what you can buy with $20 now, $20 now, and $20 now, and over a certain period of time. But to tell you the truth, if you are frugal and you, you shop for deals, you can get as much stuff or even sometimes more stuff now than you could ever get before. It just depends how you shop, but it's it's hard sometimes to get around and figure out exactly what to do, where to go, because there's so many private label brands and brands trying to reverse manipulate you in order to have you buy something that's more expensive. But at the same, at the end of the day, you can buy a great value product, which probably is lower quality, but for relatively cheap. Or you can buy a higher quality product and it could be a little bit more expensive. So. That being said, I think that we're going to a deflationary period. I think that goods are getting less and less expensive. The access to goods have been getting less and less expensive. You can see that primarily in digital content. You can get so much for your money now. And I think that's going to increase as time goes by. So the question is, why are we going towards this deflationary period? And uh, you know, how can we be so sure? Well, if you look at the income of an average American from 1979 to 2020, the income, the average income for the lower 50th percentile of Americans has only increased around 6%. So the average income for the lowest, the lowest earners in America has increased 6% from 1979 all the way to 2020. It's been a staggering amount of time. And this differs between race, gender. Uh, there are lots of different factors that determine exactly how much that has increased or decreased over time. There are certain ethnic groups that have decreased their actual minimum salary over time or how much they, they would earn those, that 50th percentile. And you can look at it. There are graphs and there are, there's charts just showing exactly what has gone over time. So that's 6% on average. The salaries of working Americans have stayed rather stagnant over time. And this coupled with deflation or this perceived hyperinflation, I believe it's deflation, the amount of purchasing power that that lowest 50th percentile has, has, has gotten over time has decreased. So while there's a deflationary effect, there's also a feeling of inflation because the salaries of those individuals have not increased. It's only increased 6%. And if we remember that inflation was 2% per year, and we can annualize it to 2% per year, it's actually decreased over time, decreased significantly over time. So the, the amount of money that's trapped within the working class has grown smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's less, there's less, there's that deflationary, there's less and you can't buy more. So all this Fed printing that's going on right now, or this clearing of debts, it really is not distributing the money at all. It's, it's, it's bailing out certain industries, it's bailing out certain corporations, whether that be the airlines, whether that be large gigantic restaurants, whether that be in the future cruise ships or this or that. That money doesn't necessarily make it down and increase the salary of a worker by 10 or 15%. It will ensure maybe that that worker has a job, but it's not going to give them a temporary raise or a permanent raise that is going to 
make them feel any different than what they were doing before. That's just how it is. So the money is just not sloshing correctly. It's, it, it gets trapped in certain bubbles. And I'm not proposing a solution to this whatsoever. I'm just stating the facts. The bottom 50th percentile of Americans have access to less and less and less over the years. And at the same time, life has gotten progressively more expensive, not in a hyperinflationary point, but just as an inflationary, just from an inflationary standpoint, but the access to choices has also increased. So yes, yeah, so this was my long rant. So I think that we're going into an extreme deflationary period and it is very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. I think that the US dollar is going to reign supreme for quite some time or the next six to 12 months, maybe even longer. People are going to be exiting, panicking. This is just the beginning. The financial repercussions of what's going on right now are massive and we are yet to feel them. And uh, it should be fun. But I think crypto is in for a beating. But at the same time, at the same time, if you can invest in crypto projects that can withstand the winter that's about to come, I think that there's a brighter future at the end of the day. And Cardano may be one of them. So I think that Cardano has a good chance of weathering the winter, just like it's been weathering the winter for the past couple of years. And when all this is said and done, then maybe it will be Cardano's time to shine. Maybe it will be crypto's time to shine. We'll have to wait and see. And until the next video, thank you.